It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell. Playing the part of Lars Fredrickson tonight is Lars Fredrickson. I thought you were going to say it was Easy e No, 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 no. Mr. Mr. Jinx, I'm going to start calling you because you can no longer show up to any show Ruby Riot is on. Well, you know what? First Uh-oh. of all, go fuck yourself. Secondly, if I was the booker, we would have had things a little bit differently, you know. Were- but man, what a crazy, crazy evening. But that was what a wonderful, wonderful experience, though. And thanks, Tony Khan, for making it happen. That was that was super awesome. Before we bring Mike Bennett on, who's down below watching this, I gotta say the best compliment I heard is I was uh at a movie theater watching it, and someone three rows back, no clue who I was, just said, uh, that was one of the best sounding bands I've ever heard at a playing someone into an arena. Well, that's so. very cool. So well, I thought I mean, you should know that. Well, that's very cool because we're very particular with our sounds. You know, it's like, it's very important. Like anytime we ever do anything like that, which is few and far between anyways, is because we don't really do that kind of stuff. It's gotta be a real special occasion. It's like, it's critical for us to have our own equipment and our own, you know, we bring our own sound man. He can't touch the board obviously because it's all union and stuff, but we always bring somebody in there to kind of like, who knows what we sound like. You know, so because that's crucial. And plus, if we didn't fucking know that song after 27 years, we should fucking pack it up, you know, throw the boots in the trash. You know what I mean? Well, Lars, uh, NWA NWA has done it again. They brought us Mike Bennett, who has always been one of my favorite people on earth. I've enjoyed watching him back when he was in New Japan for a hot second. Look at me sounding young with hot second. New Japan, Impact TNA back in the day. I mean, Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor. Yes, I the tag team specialist with a friend of the show. Uh, oh my God! I get, oh, Taven, Matt Taven. I almost blinked on his name. One of my other favorites. So, uh, Mike Bennett, thank you so much for making time to talk to us tonight. No, thank you for having me. I'm uh, I'm super pumped to be here. Um, and thank you for the introduction. It always blows my mind, like when I do shows and people talk about like list the stuff I've done because it doesn't feel like a like this big uh, chunk of stuff because you just kind of go through it. You just do it. And then, um, and then people, and then when you're in it, you know, as a performer, as an artist, you're always like, I got to do better. I got to do better. So you never really reflect on the stuff you've done. Um, so every time I hear this, I'm always like, Oh, Oh, this is kind of cool. I always think of something new where I'm like, Oh, okay. Pat yourself on the back for that. It's okay. Cool. You know? So it's um, these, these interviews are always cool for me because they're, I, I, I enjoy like talking about that stuff. More 24-7 championships than John Cena. <laughs> yes, and that. you know, <laughs> you, you know about the most. 24-7. Uh, yeah, and uh, when I won that the very first time, the first thing Maria said to me, she goes, you know, when we're long gone from this company, that is the one thing you will consistently be signing. And it is the one thing that I have st- nonstop signing and, and autograph signings, this foam green belt. Wow. It, yeah. you know what I, i'll open up with kind of my first question and i think a lot of us are smart enough to realize as long as the check cashes uh a lot of wrestlers don't care really the storylines they're given and uh because it's a business up in the uh the federation you were given a gimmick where you were kind of demasculized uh you took your wife's you know last name is yours and I, I, I get that, you know what, the check cash, I'm in the WWE, I'm going to do whatever they ask. But did you get hazed by the boys in the back for that kind of gimmick? I've never heard you talk about that aspect of that gimmick. So that's that's a good question. I, I, I've i never been asked that. And I think that's a, a fascinating question because truthfully, it was the complete opposite. I think because I was like, I, the, the locker room is hands down the best part of the company because everyone bonded. Everyone knew when you were going through the shit, you were going through the shit. And like, I always remember when, when Kofi finally broke through, there was this genuine happiness of like, oh, someone broke through, someone got through and now they're in the main event level. It's possible. Um, so we always kind of bonded over that. We knew, we knew the craziness of management. We knew how stuff went down. So we always just tried to bond. So when, when everything went down with what I was doing, I remember I did that match with Seth and Becky and then Maria berated me after. I remember I came to the back and like walked into the locker room and the boys were just like, were you okay with that? Like they were genuinely like supportive. Like, and I, in my head, I was just kind of like, 
you make, you know, chicken salad out of chicken shit. You, you like, they give you lemons, you make lemonade. Like you try. That's how I was brought in the business. Um, I wish I like maybe stuck up for myself a little bit more, but in my head, it's like, show them what you want to do and then you'll be rewarded for it. And then you'll eventually be able to do what you want to do. That was always my mindset. Um, but like the boys were always just kind of like, you're making the most of it. You're doing the best. Like, and it was always just kind of like this, I, like, meh, like, what are you going to do? Because we were all in it and we all knew it. and we all wanted TV time. So it was always like, congrats on the TV time. I think, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's this weird, this weird dynamic of like, you got the TV time, but is that, is that it? So it, it was, but they were genuinely supportive of like, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Well, do you think that experience, you know, now you're such a different wrestler, I think in, in so many ways, but do you think that experience in particular, or just, or, or just that experience that you had up North, does that make you value that creative freedom that much more? It, um, everyone always asks me the same question. Like, do you regret going to WWE? And I absolutely do not. Because like you said, I, I changed my style. I fell in love with a completely different style of wrestling that before I never would have even, I didn't give credence to, which is crazy because I worked for the company that I was in love, that I had felt fallen in love with the wrestling style. Many companies, New Japan, Ring of Honor. I was working there wanting to be a WWE wrestler. Then I became a WWE wrestler. And all of a sudden I was like, I just want to work for Ring of Honor. I just want to work for New Japan. I just want to go back where I have this creative freedom, where I can now be like, I didn't appreciate it at the time, what Ring of Honor gave me, what New Japan gave me, what impact gave me at the time to be like, go and do it. And uh, if we need to pull you back, we'll pull you back. Then you go to some place where they're like, A, B, C, D, it has to be that way. This is it. No matter what we tell you, you go, Oh, it's kind of a wake up call, you know, like you're just like, oh, this isn't what I like about wrestling. I actually like the performance. I like the creativity. I like to kind of, you know, I think when you're chasing the WWE dream, you don't yeah. think of that. You're, you're yeah. chasing the WWE dream. Then when you get it taken away from you, you go, oh, I didn't realize how good I had it. And that's all you want. You know, talking about wrestling styles and you being in the NWA and also impact wrestling and, you know, everywhere else. We've talked about this before with other NWA talents and you go on the internet and you see all kinds of some wrestling news sites, some dirt sheets, all kinds of stuff coming out of every company. But the one thing you don't see is that stuff coming out of the NWA much. How and, and I think we've we asked the Hexus when we had them on and they were in a different locker room. But now that we have someone on the mill side, how do you guys kind of manage that? Because in this day and age, that's kind of unheard of. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where I, I think everyone kind of um, in the NWA bubble in the end up, I think they all kind of see Billy's vision. And I think they're all kind of like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We, we, we trust what he wants to do. And this is the path we're going to head. And there's also a very, there's kind of like a mantra in the locker room where it's like, especially at NWA, where you, you're trying so, t trying so hard to be different because there's just so much wrestling out there. So the constant conversation in the, in the NWA locker room is what can we do to be different? What can we constantly do to be different? And like, I just, I know when we're there and we're at the tapings, the vibe is always very much like every, every locker room you go to where there's wrestlers, we're going to go out there, we're going to kill it and we're going to do our job and we're just going to knock it out of the park. Like, I think we all kind of in our heads wish there were more eyes on this product or more people watching this or more people talking about this but at the end of the day I think what we do as wrestlers and as performers is we go we're going to give it our all we're going to give everything we can to this match to this taping to what we have and then hope that that vibe that feeling that passion trickles out into other people and I think you feel it I think there are certain matches and certain episodes where you're like there's more here there's more here there's more effort there's more passion and I think we just need to focus on that well, I mean, you know, you've, you've been through a lot of companies, different companies, you've been in different locker rooms. And one of the things that I, that I know, just from my own personal experience, it's like when you're building something like what, what is happening, I, I really think in, with the NWA, it's like, it's kind of, it's not an AEW, it's not a WWE, and, you know, it's, it's not as, as accessible as maybe a lot of the, the other promotions. But what, what is happening is something very special. And I, I feel like everybody in that locker room understands that and that there's that build and there's that all for one one for all then sometimes 
it can get bigger than what it was because you've mm -hmm. built it. And then a lot of egos and a lot of other things can start to happen, right? As we've all yep. experienced in some level. So like knowing this, because I'm sure you've experienced that a, a, a few times, what are you taking into this locker room now that maybe you weren't taking in as far as your mindset, maybe the experience that you have, the advice that you have, like what's different than from, let's say your time, you know, in the other companies? So there's, there's actually a, like a, a handful of things, but for me, more importantly, the one thing that I do now when I get into a locker room, especially as, I mean, I'm 37 now, I've been wrestling for 21 years. So I've been, I'm, the veteran in the locker room, whether I right. want, want it, want right. it or not, you know? So in my head, and I think, uh, I think a uh, punk actually said something about this too, where it's this idea of like, I'm not going to treat them the way I was treated. And I right. hold that very proudly in my head. I go, when I walk into a locker room, I go, okay, I'm here so I can have a killer match. I can get over and I can keep my career going and I can become a world champion in new Japan or impact or a, I'm still selfishly pushing for myself. But when I get into a locker room, I go, how can I elevate these guys or these girls as I'm doing the same thing for myself? And so that's always my mindset when I go into NWA. It's like, I want to elevate everyone around me. Yes, I'm selfishly doing this for me. But in the meantime, I want to lift everyone up because I believe truly that if we're lifting everyone up, we're all staying afloat. There's, there's room at the top for all of us. So the more I'm lifting people up, the better it's going to be for me. And I, I, I just, I think... There was this mindset, I know for a fact, there was this mindset back in the day of every man for themselves, every woman for themselves. You stab people in the back, you politic. It got to the point where we started to realize like, wait a minute, if I hit you with a clothesline and you decide not to fall down, that doesn't mean anything. That clothesline's useless. We need each other. This industry, we need each other more than ever. So if we're going to go out there and we're going to just get a politic and stab each other in the back, what are we really doing? But if we go out there and we raise everyone up and we lift everyone up, it's like, okay, now we're all in this together. Now we can take the power of this industry back, back to the boys, back to the girls, back to the people that are killing themselves for it. So in my head, it's like you treat everyone when you get into the locker room, like we're all on this ride together. Some people will jump on, some people won't. The, the ones that won't, whatever, that's their prerogative. But the guys and the girls that want to take the ride with you, 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 you embrace them, you bring them along with you. And to me, um, that's the biggest thing. And the second biggest thing is my, my preparation and my effort. I'm just putting way more effort into every single match I have. I look, cause in my head, when I was on the Indies the first time, nobody, if I did an indie show in, in, you know, uh, nowhere in Massachusetts, no one saw it except for the people in the fans. And I've the been crowd. there. Okay. <laughs> it's a great place. Right. Um, and, uh, but now everything's streaming everything's online. Every match you have could be a breakthrough match or a moment that people talk about. So it's, um, to me, I go into every match like, oh, this is the match that people are going to finally be like, Mike Bennett's the best wrestler in the world. Mike Bennett belongs in the G1. Mike Bennett, be that's my mindset every single time. I go, I'm going to put on the best performance possible. There's no more phoning it in. And like at 37, I wish I made this decision back when I was younger because at 37, you're just like, Oh, maybe I should take it easy a little bit, but no, I, I just, in my head, I'm like, this is it. This is my, my push to be the very best. And if I, if I don't make it, then at least I know I, I went out swinging, which I'm cool with. You, you've talked in the past about your wife's involvement with ring of honor in the women's division. Uh, you work in two companies that I, I know impact for sure is always looking for producers. I'm guessing NWA is kind of the same thing. Is that something you're interested in? And, you know, what have you learned from her that might help you land one of those jobs? So what I learned from her was that I absolutely do not want to be a booker of any wrestling company ever in my entire <laughs> freaking life. Uh, no, but it's, I mean, once you realize what bookers are basically just like uh, firefighters, they just put out fires. Oh, geez, this happened. Oh, geez, this happened. Oh, God, this happened. And it's just constant where I'm like. I have so much more respect for Delirious at Ring of Honor, you know, uh, for Tony at, 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 at AEW. Like these guys, um, it's not an easy job being a booker. As far as an agent, so this is the part I struggle with. I don't like to give advice unless someone wants it. So if I'm an agent, I have to specifically critique a match, even if these guys or these girls don't want to hear it. And I only want to give my advice if, it's, if, it's more, if they want it. If they genuinely are like, did you watch it? Sure. What did you think? Okay, I'll give you my opinion. Cool. 
maybe at some point, maybe because wrestling's all I know. So I'll always want to be re- a wrestler, but like, I think my opinion, shit, it doesn't mean anything. Like I've been fortunate to be a wrestler. Like I, I, I'm, I'm a humble person. So like, I genuinely don't think my opinion means shit. And I, I just like, if someone wants it, they'll get it. But I don't like to force it on people because at the end of the day, I just go, who, who am I? What, what have I done? Like, whatever. So um, maybe at some point, if my body can't go anymore, but I don't know, I'm not, I'm not itching to be a producer. What's the hardest thing you've ever had to say to somebody? <laughs> um, oh man. I had to one day tell someone that, you know, um, he was a new student and um, I said, you know, maybe the actual wrestling aspect of pro wrestling just isn't for you. And then, which, (laughs) (laughs) which then I, I finished it with, but there are other aspects in the industry that you can, he, it just physically. And it just, you know, some people you go, it, it, it gets tougher. Like, believe it or not, it gets harder. And, you know, as people always think, like, the better you get at it, the easier it it gets more difficult because then you have to deal with more shit and more shit and more shit. And then you go, oh, the the bumping and the wrestling is the fun part and the easy part, you know? And if you don't have that down, you just go, my man, maybe maybe something else, maybe a manager, maybe referee. Like, because I don't ever tell people, I don't believe at all that there's not a spot for anyone who wants to be in the wrestling industry to be in it. If you want to work hard enough and you put in the time and the effort, there's a spot for you. Go take it. It might not be a wrestler though, because you just physically can't do it. And that was, I don't like doing that. It breaks my soul, but I was like, it might just not be for you. Sorry. It's the same thing Lars told me last week. (laughs) My heart. (laughs) I did. I once, I once heard a trainer say to a kid, um, come here, I'm going to give you some advice. I need you to take two weeks off and then quit the entire business. And I went, oh, God. <laughs> wow. What the wow. fuck? <laughs> wow. Because sometimes I get I get asked that question, you know what I mean? And it's like there's a fine line of being, like, honest and dishonest when it comes to certain things like art, and which I think that, like, wrestling is an art form yeah. in a lot of ways, you know? It's physical, yes. It's a yeah. sport, yes. I mean, there's all, there's a lot of aspects to it. So I'm always curious to, to know, like, you know, you've probably been in those situations before. I know a lot of people who have a lot of experience in their fields will generally get people up and coming up and asking for advice. So I was just curious. I digress. Dennis, pack it up. I love it. <laughs> You're known as a tag team wrestler. Uh, that's kind of where you've made your bones. You and Taven are joined at the hip. But come on, is there a little bit of view that at this age, it's like, you know what? Uh, I know you and Taven will always be joined at the hip. You guys will always be part of the kingdom, but don't you kind of want to make a singles run? Come on. You know, a hundred percent. And I, I will say it. And I've said it to Taven and Taven has said the same thing to me. And I think that's why um, we work so well, because at the end of the day, he has his individual goals and I have my individual goals and we're both okay with that. Like, the thing with me and Taven is he's genuinely my best friend in the entire world. So when he succeeds, I'm like, fuck yeah, this is amazing. Like I, when he won the ring of honor world title first, I was so incredibly happy, like genuinely super excited for him. And I know he feels the same way for me. And at the end of the day, we're both like this tag team thing is really cool. And we still have legs in it and we still have legs with it. And we still have stuff we want to do. But in the meantime, Let's keep pursuing our own goals because we never know what's going to take someone somewhere. And like, we're the same way. If I go somewhere, I'm like, even if I go singles, Taven, you're coming with me. And Taven's the same way. We just, we just look out for each other. Well, you know, looking at the wrestling landscape these days, and like we've been talking about throughout this program and throughout this podcast over the past years, a couple of years, you know, obviously the, the, the wrestling business has changed dramatically. Like you were saying you know, earlier that like every match is broadcasted in in some way, shape or form. I mean, even ones that shouldn't fucking be, you know what I mean? (laughs) It's like, it's kind of like social media. It's like, it's giving a voice to people who should not ever have one. So it's like, you know, including myself. But my point is, is that like, um, you know, looking at this, the, the broad landscape of what wrestling is now, 
Do you feel like it's a better time to be a wrestler or do you feel like it's a little bit tougher because there is so much more out there. There's a lot more professional wrestlers. It's a lot more competitive, I would think, you yeah. know, so what, what is your personal opinion? I think personally, it's probably more difficult to um, get like a bigger contract right now, like a uh, work for a WWE or an AEW. But I think there's far more avenues to get yourself recognized and get yourself noticed. And more importantly, like guys like Effie have done um, or uh, Dan Housen, there's way more opportunity to get yourself over without any wrestling company whatsoever. And I think that is the most um, inspiring and the most motivating thing for me right now is like there's more guys than ever that are solely making their living as an independent wrestler. And there's more ways to market yourself. There's more ways to make money. Uh, I was just talking to Effie about that the other day. And we were talking about like how he was like, this is how you do it. You make the money through the wrestling, but then there's also all this other side stuff that I'm doing that brings in money here, that brings in money here, that does this and does that. And I think there's a pathway now for guys to genuinely get over without ever having signed a major wrestling contract. And I think that is huge for the, for the, the talent. I think that is a huge, um, I think that's a huge benefit for them. And I think it gives them an incredible amount of leverage when it comes now to negotiating with the bigger wrestling companies. Cause then you're like, well, well, shit, I made this on the Indies by myself. You got to come up a little because I'm going to be giving up all this. You know what I mean? Like there's now that, that genuine, um, that genuine leverage that guys can now have. How, how has that affected your career path personally now? I mean, as you said, it, it changes everything. And how how hard was it for you to wrap your mind around that? Where, you know, I think the three of us are old enough to know that, you know, we grew up in an era where there was WWE, maybe there was WCW, depending on when and where. And other than that, you're wrestling in a gym in front of 20 people and you have to get contracted in order to make a living here. You yeah. are now. And that had to have been hard for you to kind of wrap your mind around. You know, what was crazy is what I ended up doing was when I was fired in April of 2020, I didn't wrestle. or I mean, nobody wrestled because of the pandemic over the entire summer, pretty much. Um, and then into the fall, but what was happening, which I started to really pay attention to, was GCW was going on. And they were putting on these shows that were only getting over online. They were streamed online. The, every, everything was based off Twitter or Instagram, but basically Twitter. And it was like these companies were growing through a social media frenzy. And guys like Effie were there and uh, guys like Dan Housen. And they put on shows like The Collective. And, um, and in my head, I said, like, I was able to watch as this happened. And I said to myself, I think this is the future. I think this is the way we're, I, I, I still could be wrong. I hope I'm not, but I think social media, the internet trending streaming, I think that's the future of wrestling. I think that's the future of a lot of the stuff that uh, we're doing right now. Um, but in my head, I almost kind of, by the end of the summer of 2020, my game plan was kind of like, get yourself really over online become a uh, uh, indie sensation, get yourself over that way, do what Effie's doing, do what Dan Houses is doing, try to build it. And it like, so for me, all I started doing was just posting videos. My, my social media is now all my wrestling stuff, all my motivation stuff. It's just constant because in my head, I'm like, I'm going to get myself over through the internet where in the old times or old times, I say, it doesn't feel like that long ago. The, the guys were, they'd have to do their moves constantly every week on TV for you to know what they do. For me, I'm just like, I'm going to keep putting up my signature moves, my signature spots, all this stuff that I do online. So if people just, they'll be flooded with it on their feed. So they'll be like, oh yeah, that's the discus elbow that he does. What does he call it? Oh yeah, that's it. Oh, that's the super kick. So they're, they're familiar. So I'm getting my moves over. I'm getting my style over. It's in my head, I'm just trying to use the internet to market myself and completely change the way people view me. But I feel like I was fortunate enough to maybe jump on that. You know, if there was any um, benefit of me being one of the first fired by WWE, I guess that was it. Where I could kind of like take a step back and kind of, figure out the landscape before they like flooded the market with people. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, when you go into the independence and you, and you, and you know, you, you're starting to kind of, like you said, become this more more 
focus in on your social media. Were you having discussions with, you know, with the commentators, if there was any, you know, for these, you know, independent shows, maybe there, some of them were broadcast and some of them weren't, you know, discussing like, hey, this is what this move's called or any of that stuff. Were you doing any of that to, because like you were saying, you know, being on TV every week and they're calling what you're doing, the listeners obviously connecting and, you know, understanding what, what it is, the psychology of it all. But it's obviously harder in the independent scene to keep that psychology going. So were you doing any of that? Oh, absolutely. I'm a, Kevin Kelly was the one who taught me how to uh, basically use and abuse the commentators. He's like, they're literally telling your story right now. They can get you over or they can't get you over. But if they don't know anything about you, they can't get you over. So I've always made it a point to go up and talk to the, the commentators and be like, this is what I'm doing. This is the name of this, this, blah, blah, blah. But more importantly, what I started doing lately, which I didn't do before, was I started telling the promoters uh, or sorry, the, the um, commentators, what my own personal story was, what I was mm. trying to get across, what I, I blatantly told them, I'm trying to change my wrestling style. I don't want to be sports entertainer, Mike, anymore. I'm trying to be more pure Noah, New Japan, old school Ring of Honor style. Can you tell that story for me? If you see a move that you notice Nigel did, can you be like, hey, that's a Nigel McGuinness move I once saw him do. I was like, can you tell that story? Because to me, I never did that before. I was so focused on trying to get signed by WWE that in my head, I was like, you'll get there. They'll tell you what to do. It'll be, I was just talking to my Maria about this as that was my mindset. It was get there. They'll tell you what to do. Go kill it. And everything will be fine. Hunky dory. Life will be great. That was my mindset. And I never really focused on what story I wanted to tell on this journey, who I wanted people to remember Mike Bennett as. And now that's really all I think about in my head. I go, and it's probably because I have kids now too, where I'm just like, who do I want them to remember me by? When, when they think, when, when people talk about Mike Bennett, the wrestler, I want them to talk about a guy who was a badass fucking wrestler, who was a ring of honor wrestler, who was a new Japan wrestler. I don't want them to talk about Mike Kanellis. I mean, whatever. I, I, I'm okay with it because at the end of the day, I'll tell my kids, I became, I, I set out a goal. I did it. I accomplished it. There's stuff to be taken away. But, I'm now telling people this is my story because I want you to connect with me. I don't want you to connect with what a company might make me. I want you to connect with me, Mike Bennett, the person. Damn, this is hard because now I got another question I want to ask, and that was perfect. You know what? I'm going to go with my original question. Maybe we'll put a pin in that and circle back hey, to the evolution. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Just ask him the fucking question, Dennis. Don't, <laughs> don't pussyfoot around this guy. He can okay, take man. it. Listen, he can take right. it. I mean, how many times was he the 24-7 champion? Right. Two, three hundred? Twice. Twice. He, he, That's all I he, needed. Bef yeah, before the numbers started getting inflated. I mean, you're, talk you're, talk you're talking to an ex-24-7 yes. WWE yeah. champion. Yeah. He probably has PTSD, wakes up wait, looking for someone to pin him in the middle of the night. I, I, I wake <laughs> up hoping to, hoping to not be in those segments. I bet you wait. <laughs> or wake up hoping to be pinned. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Well, give, me, give me, give me out of this. You, you are one of the few people that are signed by Impact and signed by uh, uh, NWA. And in past interviews, you've talked about how Ring of Honor is your home. And uh, looking at kind of the landscape of Ring of Honor now, and knowing that you're, you know, this may not be a fair question, but you're still contracted by two other companies. Is there a little bit of you that hopes that maybe you could get freed up to, to, to? to get a foot into that ring of honor to still make a name or you, I don't know how to ask that question without uh, stepping on toes. No, I, I, I think it's a fair question and ring of honor is my home. It will always be my home. It gave me my first opportunity. Um, it, I, I believe ring of honor is the reason why I've been able to see whatever success I've been able to see. They gave me a break. They gave me a chance. Delirious constantly put his neck out for me. He gave me a match with Tanahashi. Like he constantly did. They, that place is my home. Like I just, they were at my wedding. Like I just, I can't shake that feeling. But um, the stuff that Impact and Scott Demore and Billy Corgan did when that company closed is they took us all in. Like they brought us in like a bunch of like land of misfit toys. They were like, we have this and impact gave us a really good spot. Not only did they bring us in, but they gave us a huge storyline. So I, I'm a, I'm also a man of my word. And so I won't, 
based on what impact has done for me and based on what NWA, I'll always finish my contract with people that are loyal to me and treat me with respect. I'll always do it. And so to them, the, the stuff that the fact that they just kind of were like, um, we'll bring you in and let's figure this out. We're going to give you a main storyline. Not only that, but the storyline is going to be about actual gripes that you kind of really have. I was like, Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll never ask to get out uh, early. Um, but, um, I, I do, I do love ring of honor and that's my home and it'll always be my home. So, um, if there's a chance at some point, hell yeah, I, I love that place. Is there somebody at this point in, in, in the NWA or maybe even an impact that you really want to get in a program with? And because, you know, the way I see you as a wrestler now, I feel like you can mix with a lot of different people. You know what I mean? And I think that, that, that to your credit, you can, I think you could have a decent match with just about anybody. I don't really necessarily know if like, you know, to kind of, talk about dennis's question if ring of honor would, is is actually a, a good place for you right now in a weird way mm -hmm. i feel sure. like there's still so much to do for you in both of the other companies but like i was asking is there somebody that you're kind of like man i w really wish i could get my hands on him or whatever it is uh josh alexander not a, not a question i me and josh worked at uh aaw in chicago um and you know there's just um as a performer at large yourself, I think you know this, when you get out there and things are just going and they're just working and you know when shit's going right, right? Like yeah. you just know when a performance is on. That's how I felt with, with Josh. You just get in there and you go, oh, oh, we just work well together. We just wrestle a lot alike. We know where each other's gonna be. Like we just move very similar and you can just tell when something's going well. Um, I would love to bring that to impact, maybe throw the world title in there. We both have a lot, we have similar stories. Like we're both tag team wrestlers um, and we've both been trying to like build our name up and come out of the shadows. And like, he does Canadian strong style. I do Boston strong style. I would love to just get in there and impact with him and have like a 30 minute match and just, go balls to the wall that that gets me that gives me goosebumps i get excited thinking about it because it's so much fun when you go in there with someone that you know you're going to get it it's going to be intense it's going to hurt a little bit but that's always fun you're like all right this is my guy and it, it gets you excited all right i'm going to circle back to the first question the evolution of the <laughs> character you're an old dog now in the industry it's hard to teach you new tricks how how do you evolve the mike bennett character at this point can you is it small stuff can you do it on a grander stage i you you say you you put a lot of uh, thought into it how how much you know can the mike Bent character evolve i think there's always room i think there's always um different areas you can tweak different things you can do different ways you can interpret things different ways you can take things um I mean, to me, honestly, the one thing as a crazy messed up wrestler that always goes on in my head, I'm always like, man, you've been doing a lot of motivational speaking. What if you just became an asshole all of a sudden and been a heel about it? like, what if you went anti motive You know what I mean? Like there's always way I'll never do it because I hold that shit way too close to my heart, like actually helping people. But, um, as a wrestler in my mind, you're always thinking of that weird shit of like, what if I became an evil mode? Like, I think there's always ways to just kind of navigate your story and change who you are. Um, because for me right now, the one glaring issue that I thought I had was I need to prove to people that I'm an actual professional wrestler. I was always sports entertainer, Mike Bennett. I had Maria by my side. She was a WWE person. I was always told I was going to WWE because I had the whatever the look was at the time. Um, and I, I embraced that. I actually, I, 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 but now I was like, no, I want people to be like that. Mike Bennett, like that's a fucking wrestler. Like you, I want to see him wrestle Brian. I want to see him wrestle punk. I want to see him wrestle Kenny Omega or Jonathan Gresham, or I want to, I want to be on that list. Like that's my goal. And so to me, that's the main objective get myself completely over as a wrestler. And then once I feel like, hopefully I have the, the, that mindset that, you know, I don't even know what I'm searching for, whatever it is that I want. Um, then maybe I'll, I'll reinvent myself somehow, but I always think there's room for it. Well, I guess I, my question is kind of along the lines of what we're just talking about, because you said something that was very interesting to me because I do the same thing. How you were talking about, you know, your motivational speaking and then the, how you could be, 
an evil motivational speaker. <laughs> yeah. So you, you're you always, I mean, as creative people, we always are looking at things. Sometimes we verbalize them. Sometimes we keep them here until the day that we die, right? So have you ever imagined the scenario or, and I'm sure you have, of walking back up the door, into the doors up north? And if so, do you, what is your fantasy all about? Or what, do you, how would you want to see it play out? I'm just curious. You know, it's that, that's a tough or, one. Or, 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 or do you just never want to go back there? So there's, um, there's a very deep um, part of me that does not want to go back um, because I, I wasn't before, but I'm a big person now that I believe in my own values and what I hold near and dear to my heart. And I have a hard time working for places that don't at least have similar values that as I do, or our values don't line up. And the way Vince runs his industry, the way WWE runs business is a hard thing for me to uh, try to align with, but um, I'm also in wrestling and I'm not an idiot and there's never say never. And if you were to ask me, if I were to take a guess, if I'll ever be back, I'd probably say yes, because I've, I've been in this industry for 21 years and I didn't think half the people that went back or ever got there would ever go there. Um, so for me, honestly, I think, um, I don't know, because I don't hold like a lot of, um, I haven't really envisioned it because it's not really like an end game for me. What I have envisioned is wrestling in the G1 climax and what that looks like every single day and having those matches. What I have envisioned is wrestling Jonathan Gresham and what it would mean if I won the ring of honor world title or getting in there with Wheeler and wrestling for the pure title and having those moments. Um, those moments of changing people's minds, because honestly, at the end of the day, I realized how nothing WWE did ever made sense so I don't know what I was looking for. What I'm, what I'm looking for, I don't know because I don't really care to stick it to Vince McMahon. Like he's nuts. I don't care. Right. It doesn't matter to me. Um, what matters to me is now I have these own personal goals that I've set out for. And like, you know, at the end of the day, when I'm, if I hit, you know, if I'm still wrestling at 45 and they want to pay me millions of dollars to come in once a week or, you know, I'm sure so. But at this point, I love what I'm doing now. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoy just going out there and each match having people go, you know, one of the, uh, I'm, I'm ranting and I'm sorry, but one of the, um, one of the coolest moments I ever had was that Josh, Josh Alexander match at AAW because after the match, the promoter pulled me aside and he said, I have had people come up to me and go, I didn't know Mike Bennett wrestled that way. I've only seen him <laughs> as Mike Kanellis. And I went, ah, oh, that's the greatest fucking compliment I could ever get because that's the point And that's the journey that I'm on right now. Right, right, right. And that hot tub's not going to pay for itself. And <laughs> let's be honest. I mean, when you open up that three seasons room and you put the hot tub, you need a plaque that says this hot tub was paid for by Vince McMahon. Right. That's right. So, yeah. well, you know, uh, what do you have to do in your mind now to make that, that next step to be invited to the G1 to, to, to do all this stuff? Because look, you're an accomplished guy. I think any tournament out there would be lucky to have you in it. Even if you bowed out in the first round, they'd be lucky to have you in it. But what do you have to do? You talk about these goals. How do you make that step? I have to, um, I have to be consistent. I have to continuously do what I say I'm going to do um, because I look back at my, 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 my first time at ring of honor. And um, there were, there were some instances where I had some really good matches like against Steen and um, Lance storm. And, but they were like, they weren't consistent enough to get to that point where people were like, okay, you're Mike Bennett, one of the best in the world you're. And so for me, what I'm trying, I know it takes time. I know this shit's a progress. I know it's a slug. I know it's a grind. So in my head, it's, it's, it's each match. It's the next match. It's proving them wrong the next time. And then the next time and the next time. And as long as I have this chip on my shoulder, I like it because I'm never going to slow down. It doesn't give me the, every time I go to an indie now, I'm like, this has to be the best match on the show. I need to get people talking. I like that mindset right now. At a certain point, it might switch and change, but I like the desperation I feel right now because to me, it's like you want to take the island, you burn the fucking boats, you do everything. That's my mindset. Every match is, is make or break. And so to me, that's how you do it and you keep it going because 
I don't want to be the guy that just rests on his accomplishments. I don't want to be the guy that was like, oh, I wrestled at WWE. I wrestled at Ring of Honor, two-time Ring of Honor world uh, tag champ, to, uh, IWGP. I don't want that. I don't, I, I want people to, I want to be the guy that when I show up, they went, holy shit, that was a hell of a match. And, or holy, holy shit, I didn't know Mike Bennett could wrestle like that. Or holy shit, I want to come back and see him wrestle. Like, that's what I'm looking for right now. Um, sorry, I got distracted. Nice. Um, something super beautiful came walking through my door. Me? But no, absolutely not you. <laughs> uh, way better looking. But um, you know, we were talking about you know taking it to the next level, right? So the G one, all these things that you want to do. Dennis was asking you obviously about how do you stick, get your foot in the door. So how do you feel like you're going to find that consistency, like you're talking about? I mean, is it are we talking about more programs? with equal caliber wrestlers. I mean, you know, it seems like it's one of those things that it sounds like it's easy to, to accomplish in a weird way, but don't you need a partner to kind of also help elevate that? Like, you know, so, you know, who, do you feel like what you're doing right now in professional wrestling is gonna get you to that place? Or do you feel like you need to take another step? I, I feel like, I, I think I need to take another step. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. I think it's, um, I think it's probably now, um, getting in the ring with guys that I know are light years better than me. Um, mm. I need to get in the ring with Brian. I need to get in the ring with punk. I need to get, because I say this to him and I'll say it here. Cause I say it to his face all the time. Every time I wrestle Jonathan Gresham, I become a better wrestler. Like I just, when we put the match together, I become a better wrestler. When we're in there, I become a better wrestler. When we pick apart the match afterwards, I become a better wrestler. So that's, I think that's the next step. I think it's, having these matches and proving that I'm good enough to hang with these guys. Now let me get in the ring with these guys and we can see if we can blow the doors off the place. And then hopefully with uh, me getting better and being in there with guys like Brian and punk and Joe and Gresham and Josh Alexander, you'll get to the point where you, you just, you get to their level by learning from them as you go. And so that's that, I think that's the next step. So to me, what I need to do is keep having these really good matches on the indies. So at a certain point they'll go, Oh, we want to see what a Brian versus Mike looks like, or a Mike versus punk looks like. And so then that generates and that swells and then hopefully something happens and then you can get in the ring with them. Um, and so that's, that's really, I think, I think that's the next step. I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of winging it right now, but I think, I think that is the next step. Plus you're well, I mean, it's part. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Dennis. I was just going to say the manifestation of just putting that out there is part of the whole process. Right. So Hell it's yeah. like, you know, it, you know, wh whether you're winging it or not, you do have a vision and a clear way to get there. But I mean, I'm going to digress. Go ahead, Dennis. Cause I think you had something important to say. I was yeah, just going to carry on about how great he was, but. <laughs> I, no, I, was also, means, <laughs> I was also going to say the way matches are put together are a whole lot different now than even five years ago, where uh, back in the day, you know, you you may not have gotten all your stuff in if you were going to take the first round beat out of a tournament. Now the other opponent wants you to get your stuff in because it makes them oh, look yeah. better when they put you over. Yeah, it's it's an entirely um, it's an entirely different world, but it's also what you're seeing, which I think is really cool, is you're seeing a lot of younger talent now that grew up watching Ring of Honor. So that's the style they already want to do. Um, and so they're trying to take that to the next level. So I'm trying to be like, oh, okay, I know this Ring of Honor style. Now let me try to see if I can take that to the next level. And then also let me try not to do so much that it is a crazy clusterfuck of a match. Let me try to now incorporate some of the stuff I learned at WWE and come up with my own type. You know, I'm not trying to be a copy of anything. I'm trying to be Mike Bennett who worked for all these companies, um, but is solely focused now on trying to be like a ring of honor style wrestler. But I think there's something to be said about the shit that I learned at WWE and then the stuff that I learned at impact. You know, I think there's a lot of um, different aspects of me that if I throw it all into this strong style type of wrestling and this Noah style type of wrestling, I think I can maybe hopefully produce something that no one's ever done before. Cause I'm not going to be just strong style, or I'm not going to be just new Japan style or ring of honor style or any of this, or just pure style. I want to try to mix in stuff. I learned at WWE stuff. I learned at impact. Maybe I can slow it down, tell a better story, all that type of stuff. Um, but 
it's cool with this young with this younger talent because they grew up watching a lot of the Ring of Honor guys. So a lot of them already want to do these types of matches. So then it's like, okay, let's do these types of matches and then let's slow it down a little and then let's pick it up here. So um, it's a lot different, but it's kind of fun navigating that course. Did you want to say something else, Dennis? I, I, I did because I just thought of the perfect Mike Bennett gimmick. I want to see him start mansplaining his career to other people in promos where he's like dropping, you know, uh, this reminds me back in uh, WWE when I was about to wrestle X, Y, and Z or, <laughs> you know, this right here back when I was ring of honor champion or tag team champion. And you just, you just run down your whole career to every single person. <laughs> oh, every my accomplishments. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's, I, that's I mean, it. that's, a, that's, that's actually a great idea because I do love it because then you can be that, you know, you, you, you're not going against that, the, 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 um, the, the positive mental attitude, but you're bringing this whole, you know, ego to it. I think that this yeah. could be a good move for you. I, I, Dennis, actually, I, I, I actually really like it. I love this idea of being the obnoxious guy that's constantly listing off his list of accomplishments. I, just, I think that's fucking awesome. I, I could see you going, you know, you're talking to a two time 24 seven champion, 24 right? seven. I mean, you, you know, just I throw that stuff out. Like it's huge. That would be so awesome. The, the doctor's appointment. You realize that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Listen, Lars, if you don't have any more questions, it's time to uh, one play last this. question. Yeah. One we're last... going to play the game, but I got one last question. Okay? okay. Because there was something that was interesting that we were talking about and one of the things, but it wasn't set. You didn't say it until you were, until it was later. It's about the psychology, you know, especially when you're talking about Japanese wrestling, which is, you know, it's not a bunch of high spots. It's not about mm -hmm. always getting all your stuff in. It's about telling that story. Right. Yeah. And that's something that like, you know, I think a lot of the modern wrestling it has at moments, but it, 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 but it sort of, sort of disregards a lot of the time. And that's one of the things as a wrestling fan that like I get frustrated with because I want to be brought, brought, brought into that story. So as far as that psychology part of the wrestling business, where do you feel like that fits in with you with where you're at now? It, um, it's actually a massive part of what I'm doing. And it's, um, it, it kind of goes into play with what I was saying. Every time I wrestle Gresh, I'm a better wrestler because every time we put matches together, the only thing we ever talk about is the story and the psychology that we're trying to tell. I truly believe, and again, uh, I could be totally wrong on this, but I think the way wrestling is trending is they're going to want to see matches where they're, is a lot more psychology and storytelling than mixed in with some of the high spots that we're seeing. Because I think there's something incredibly compelling about if you're working someone's leg over time and time again, and they're selling it so incredibly fucking good. And then there's some big move near the end of them. You can make people bite on simple shit just based on your selling alone. If they genuinely, all it takes is one split second to go, oh, I think he landed on that. Oh. That's how you usually walk on something if it hurts. Yeah, I've, I've torn my ACL. That's how I walked when I tore my... And then if someone comes in and does just a fucking like disgusting chop block to it, you might go, hey. like you just, you know, like that one split second and then you fucking have the person. Then they're hooked because then they're like, oh God, is this real? Or everyone knows it's not real anymore. But if you can just convince them for a split second that that looks like it might hurt, you got them. Because people just want to be fucking entertained. People want to, they don't, they want to suspend their disbelief. So 100%. if you can do it for a split second, it, they'll buy it. They'll buy it. And then you got them hooked because they'll be like, oh shit. And then everything you do from there, you just pile it on and pile it on and pile it on. That's what I loved about work in Gresh was we would focus so much on the selling and the storytelling that when we started to pick it up, people were fucking so into it because they were so invested in what we were telling and how our body language was telling what hurt or how tired we are. That like, that to me is everything about wrestling. Like, and I'm so glad you brought up the Japanese wrestling because I think they do it better than anybody. They like, I hate this idea that, Oh, strong styles, just no selling bull fucking shit. It's fighting. Those guys sell better than anyone I've ever been in the ring with. And you genuinely believe like when I see Okada go back and forth with somebody and then he takes one really good shot and then he winds up and he just like, that's real. 
like that people go through that shit you get adrenaline and all of a sudden the pain is just way too much so you collapse and then you try to fight through it again i've watched brian and suzuki that match a million fucking times because of that storytelling um and i think that's so important i love it i think that's how you play with people's emotions this interview is playing with my emotions. This is great. <laughs> you know, you know, he, I think he's got somebody working the camera. Because have you noticed that they're zooming up? It's yeah, it's insane. I don't know. I, I must have this new Zoom type feature on my my Zoom. It's so weird, dude. That's awesome. They just I keep... they want to see my sweet Banksy picture of this. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, is it like some of the acid that I took that was got stored in my fat cells when I was sixteen is like finally coming out right now. <laughs> it's the <laughs> when me and. <laughs> yeah, when me and Dennis were talking before you got here, it started doing it. And I was like, oh, fuck, what's happening? This is wild. I was like, this guy's high tech. Wow. Oh, no, no, yeah, I know. Mike well, Bennett, wait high till tech you see wrestler. this fucking setup that I have. And then you'll be like, no, that's, that's the guy that's got two fucking kids. Well, yeah, Mike Bennett, enough. we're about to play the most anticipated game in all of wrestling podcast history. What is Mike Bennett watching? Here's the rules, Mike Bennett. Okay. You are the judge. Me and Lars have to guess what you're currently watching or within a week or so. Um, okay. You hand out points between a half point and a full point based on how recently or how current you're watching. And uh, there's basically three rounds. If we're tied going into the third round, we go into an overtime where we keep guessing. Okay. Uh, Lars, you are practically whooping my ass on every podcast in this game. No, no, first. no, no. Dennis, not practically. Yeah. Damn whooping. Thanks. Okay. So I'm just going to go a pretty obvious one. You know, uh, you're probably just finished or watching Stranger Things. Whoa. That's mm. it's one I have to get on because I've, I've, I've seen every episode, every well, season, thank, but I haven't, hey. I haven't caught up yet. Yeah, well, thanks for fucking nothing, all right, bro? Go ahead, Dennis. <laughs> going Obi-Wan. I'm going to get murdered for this. I am not a Star Wars fan. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm not. And it's not because I don't like it. It's just because I've never taken the time to uh, actually sit down and watch it. Thanks for nothing. I don't How think do you, you guys are going to guess this because it's fucking ridiculous what I just watched. So it's Well, I, okay, so... How old are your kids, if you don't God mind me asking? damn you. I hate when you do this shit. <laughs> they are two and four. So you've been watching a lot of Paw Patrol. Yes. yes. I'm not going to sink to your level. I'm not going to do that. Um, sink, sink to the winning level? That's that's that's. Don't good. you mean yeah. rise to the winning level? Go ahead. Look, I've got one in my back pocket. I'll throw it if I have to in the third round. If I'm down one nothing, um, well, you are you are down one nothing. <laughs> well, that's only my second guess. Okay, I got one good. more round. All right, uh, well. Mike Bennett, you're breaking my heart here. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm gonna say you're a guy that still appreciates some of the classics, right? Maybe uh, it's a shot in the dark. Arrested Development. No. 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 Sorry. Okay, so, I actually so, never watched one episode of that. You should. I heard. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. So do you have like a cable system or direct TV or do you just stream everything? Usually stream. I got Hulu and Netflix and all that fun stuff. Okay. 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 I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say. So do you, what, what did you gave us a little bit of a clue? You said, if we were to guess, we were going to think you were a nerd or something like that or something like that. I don't know if nerds the right way. Uh, okay. No, definitely much. not nerd. You're talking yeah. way too much, Mike Bennett. <laughs> Keep going, Mike. Keep going. Uh, no. Um, if you found out what I just watched, you would be like, oh, that um, that WWE angle isn't so far off from the truth. Oh. I don't know if you'll get it, though. It's because I'll have I to explain why I'm watching it or why I watched it. 
Okay. Well, I'm going to stay away because I know that you're married and stuff like that. And I know, <laughs> yeah. and, and I, and I feel like you guys are either watching love at first sight or 90 day fiance. No, okay. But you're on, you're on the right track of okay. the wife stuff. Okay. Okay. Mm, this is tough well, now because I'm going to, I just, gonna, ga- I just gave you a softball, Dennis. I don't even know. That's how soft it is. Um, I, I don't think I could pull it. So now I've got two safe ones. One you always right. guess. I'm not going with. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal the kids show to stay alive, okay. and I'm gonna say Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Yes, 100%. okay. I'm still alive. Yeah, that was a safe play. Yeah, fuck you, Lars. <laughs> yeah, it sucks when that happens, doesn't it? No. No, it doesn't. Because you know what? I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come out the victor on this one. Because <laughs> I'm thinking if he's watching some stuff with his wife, and it's not love at first sight, and it's not 90 Day Fiance, but it has something to do with his. Hmm. It's I I I I feel like, hey babe, he's calling cheater. I can't remember the name of the show, but I think I know the show. Are you talking about the show when the couples get together and talk to the therapist? No. <laughs> okay. Thanks for helping me out in that. Okay, so then, <laughs> so then uh, I'm going to say that you just watched Ozark. No. No, we, ah. we, 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 we've talked about we've talked about watching it, but we've never... All right, Dennis, you're still alive. Dennis, mm-hmm. you're still alive. You know um, what? You can have them. You can have them. <laughs> <laughs> this is tough because I... I don't know what reality show he's talking about. So The Bachelor? I'll tell you this. It's not reality. It's just when you ask. So to me, it's like if I was by myself, I wouldn't watch this show because I wouldn't know it existed. But my wife had it on. So I was like, I'll watch this because it's on. Right. Mm -hmm. We're in overtime, Lars. Well, I just guessed. And it's your guess. You can take the win. I did. I just guessed. I I said said guess The Bachelor. Oh, The Bachelor. Okay, shit. All right. I'm trying to think of all the, 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 uh, the, so it's not a reality show. No. Okay. Is it on Hulu? No. All right. You know what? I'm going to say, I'm just going to say this. I'm, I'm just, cause I'm going to get away from that. I'm going to say you're watching The Simpsons. No, I haven't watched all The right. Simpsons in a while. I don't watch that much TV, so I'm. This is I watch a, I watch a lot of wrestling, a lot of old school Japanese wrestling. So it's that's where I'm at. And then I watch my kids. How about uh, Heels? I haven't seen it. No. Okay, are you watching um, on Vice TV? Do you do you watch Vice TV? I have watched Vice TV. Yes. Okay. So I guess you're watching uh, Dark Side of the Ring. I have watched that recently. Yes. Yep. Probably within okay. the last five days or so. Yeah. Okay. okay. That counts okay. As a yeah. point. Okay. There you go. Or, yeah, okay. So Dennis, for the tie or for the loss. <laughs> Love after lockdown. I don't even know what that is. That's good. Love Thank after lockdown. Over. Thank God. <laughs> Mike, tell me what show you're fucking watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Downton Abbey. Oh, this is over. We're done recording. <laughs> Fuck Mike Bennett. I don't. I. 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 I keep like every time I'm watching it, I keep expect like it's just so just there. There's like I'm like I keep expecting like a murder or like like something to explode or like a scandal, and I'm like, this is just about British royalty. Like there's nothing really here. I didn't say I enjoyed it. I just said I watched it. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do things like, you know, for the, for you your know, loved ones. Exactly. Uh, well, I'm divorced, I guess. <laughs> wow. Uh, Mike, where can people find you? I know NWA is going to be in Nashville uh, the middle of June. So July, yep. uh, June. So uh, June. where can people find you? Yeah, uh, we'll be in Nashville um, in June. Uh, check out NWA. Um, check out their Twitter, social media, everything. Um, and then, believe it or not, Impact will be in Nashville the following week. So I'll be there uh, for Slammiversary 20th anniversary, which should be a lot of fun. Um, there's going to be two surprises. It's uh, Honor No More versus uh, Team Impact. And currently it's uh, Frankie Kazarian, 
um, Chris Saban and Alex Shelley, and there's still going to be two more originals. So we'll find out who that is coming up, which will be cool. It should be a lot of fun. Um, and then just follow me on social media, Real Mike Bennett on Twitter and uh, the Real Michael Bennett on Instagram. That's usually where I use it the most. Um, and I like to interact with fans. So hit me up if I see it. I try to talk to as many people as possible. Um, I don't just try to respond to negative bullshit. I actually try to not respond to that and po the positive shit and the Good actual man. fans I try to respond to. Thank you. Um, I used to, and then I was like, this, this isn't helping. This is helping nobody. Um, so then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to appreciate the people that appreciate me on my social media. And, <laughs> and be, so, like yeah, the, so be like the Quakers. Why the fuck right. not? You have fans. I was like, just be nice to the people that are nice to you. It's easy. Oh, see, see that camera simple. work? I yeah. got my little oh, camera I'm working on impressed. there. Yeah. I think Maria's behind there, zooming in and zooming out. <laughs> She's going yeah. back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, babe. Uh, yeah. Uh, please get back to doing your lives on your, your video. That was one of my favorite things I used to watch, and that's what really made me become a big fan of yours. Thank you. Yeah, no, I will. I, I've loved it. And like I said, life got in the way uh of like real life shit i got real busy with wrestling so i was on the road a ton in the months of april and may um but this summer's looking like i can fit out a path where i can finally fit that back into my schedule um so i've started to become a very schedule oriented guy so uh it's been fun to try to fit that out so eventually i'll fit it back in there somewhere well, for the people at home, the show is over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. It's a wrestling perspective. Rate, subscribe, follow, do all that other podcasty bullshit that we ask you to do. Thank you, Mike Bennett, for hanging out with us. Thank you, guys. It was a lot of fun.